Welcome to another edition of The Real Money Show, the number one eight seven seven eight silver and the website guildhallwealth.com. We're going to be talking about all things real money today. Silver, obviously, is real money. Gold is real money. Before we get started, great news. Uh, very excited. We're going to have Gerald Salente of the Trends Journal on our, sh- our program next week. So watch out for that. We'll also be posting it to YouTube. Uh, we'll, we'll let it, our listeners know about that throughout the show. So again, next week, you've got to tune in. Gerald Salente of the Trends Journal will be joining us. Jerry, how are you doing? Very good, Jeremy. Great to be back on the show. Feeling great. It's been an interesting week in the metals. Let's start with availability. How's, how's our uh, inventories these days? It's getting better, must say. We are... Um we don't. We no longer have any delays delivering direct to people. Uh, so we, again, we ship direct to your door, or you can uh, schedule a time where you can pick up. Uh, but uh, one ounce bars are in stock for gold. Uh, one ounce gold maples are in stock. Ten ounce gold kilo bars even. And on the silver side, we have everything: silver maples, brand new 2021 coins, uh, bars, ten ounce either Asahi RCM, a very popular kilo bars are back in stock kilos and 100 ounce bars uh, we have them available but premiums still still elevated than where they were a year and a half ago yeah yeah hopefully that will somehow start to change well a lot of a lot of news out of Mexico as you mentioned earlier today well this is a this is something that I just heard about and uh, we just confirmed that in Mexico they shut down all the mines uh, because of COVID, because of COVID so that uh, and they're the biggest supplier in the world not to mention that you know, there's already a 200 million ounce deficit right now every year on the product. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into that and, and its effects with uh, things like the Green New Deal going forward. So um, availability looks pretty good. We're, yeah. we're also working on additional sources within the registered accounts so that uh, we can continue to uh, supply our, our buyers in the market because there's a growth in, in, in demand for physical metal within the registered accounts. And what we offer at Guildhall is not just access or or um, exposure to physical product but it's uh, we allow clients to actually own their own product so they're buying the product directly within their registered account retail product within their registered account like one ounce gold bars one ounce gold coins hundred ounce silver bars um, would love to get back the 10 ounce silver bars that would be right. great but we are offering the maples so those come in a tube of 25 so I like that they get a little bit more of that liquidity being able to sell off in small increments so that's within our registered accounts and one of the things before we dig into some of the news as well let's talk about um, Liras, because before we jumped on air, Jerry, you were mentioning that, you know, unfortunately in this environment, um, economically speaking, um, stimulus aside, um, you know, um, construction and and those type of things aside, you're seeing a lot of job losses. Mm -hmm. And that means people are are having to move their pensions around. Yeah. Um, One in particular, a great friend of mine, he has an RSP with us, and you know they, he was an executive with a r- rather large firm in in Toronto, and they let him go. You know the payroll couldn't afford him, so he was left with uh, the pension. And I brought up the pensions last week on the show. The C.D. Howe Institute wrote a rather scathing report on the Canadian pension plan back in ninety ninety six. Um, how pretty much in the first line of the report says the Canada the Canada pension plan the CPP is a is pretty much a Ponzi scheme, and Ouch. you know as people are reading about these realities and reading things about you know stock markets and currency devaluation people are looking at at gold and um, they let him go uh, he rather sizable pension uh, and which then becomes a lira so Canadians do have the option although your CPP and your pension plan have your money and decide on what they would like to do with it ignoring the most negatively correlated asset class in gold and silver that offers true protection especially during a, s- a systemic crisis if there is ever one like another 2008 um, but they're ignoring gold but now Canadians can get their hands on gold and as Gerald Salente says, putting some gold in the golden years, and that's was that that was actually the report of the CD Howe Institute. Uh, it was called "Putting Some Gold in the Golden Years: Fixing the Canada Pension Plan." Canadians can, can now and are taking the wheel for themselves. 
So he's very thankful. He's moving forward with, uh, with rolling the pension into a lira, which we can help with every step of the way from opening the account and doing the back and forth paperwork with the pension companies. It's, it can be difficult for some people, so they can rely on Guildhall, the Guildhall team to look after them. Yeah, we do the heavy lifting in that regard. So we help people move their liras or locked in RSPs or even a RIF if it's uh, uh, being held somewhere. And uh, you can, we can move it over to our partner Quest Trade and we can help you acquire physical precious metal in that account. Now, not to forget that for every $10,000 invested in physical precious metals or spent in, in acquiring precious metals, you get one gram of gold, up to 10 grams. This is an incredible rebate because each gram is worth, I think, about $75 Canadian. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could get up to 750 back gold grams in your pocket. We send that to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great way to take care of some of the incidentals. You know, there's a trade fee, allocation fee. These, you know, one gram is going to cover all of that okay. plus. And then, you know, the rest kind of digs in on, on the, the overall cost for the retail product. Um, so that's something that we can do. We do help people move from one institution to another. And I find, Jerry, that with these uh, pensions, with Liras in particular, you do notice a trend at least from those that are coming to Guildhall of, you know, the market, the, the pension not doing amazing given what you're supposed to be seeing or what the mainstream uh, financial media tells you about how great things are, mm -hmm. but you just don't necessarily see those type of gains all the time in these pensions, but you definitely see the fees going out to the management. And, uh, you know, I think that there's room for everything. And I think that's partly why people would diversify. It also leads into this idea that you don't have to diversify every section of your portfolio. If you have a TFSA, you don't have to say, oh, okay, my, I've got 65,000 I can spend or 75,000 that I can spend. Let me put a portion of that into gold or silver. No, you can just look at your overall portfolio or your overall wealth and say, oh, you know what? I'll just use my pension for all of this mm -hmm. physical precious metal. Um, so you look for what's working for you, what's not working for you. I think it's just a good opportunity overall to to look at how your investments are working for you and make sure you are diversified. The number one eight seven seven eight silver the website guildhallwealth.com. Um, how did you, uh, what did you think when you heard about the Mexico mining shutting down? Premiums right off the bat, Jeremy. I mean, you know, we are, we are very hopeful that Premiums can somehow go back to where they were. Um, right now, we are looking at four or five bucks uh, on silver over over the ounce, and uh, oh, close to what, sixty dollars for gold. So, what would you say to someone? You know, I, I don't get this question often, but maybe maybe you do. Someone who says, "Well, I'll I'll wait, see if those premiums come down." Okay, let's look at the mines. The mines have to crank uh, crank up production full force, full throttle. Um, we need more silver coming out of the grounds. People, you know, retail investors go away. They're not looking for something to hedge against risk. A lot of investors and Canadians are worried that there could be a stock market crash and melt up. Um, so these things have to go away and disappear. So I, on that note, let, let's just look at the refining for a moment because I, okay. I do find the gold refining, silver refining, similar to, to oil refining, right? It's like the refining can kick up the price more than just what's, what's actually available in the raw form. Um, but, you, you know, there seems to be a, a sense that the major refiners around the globe don't look at the investment demand as something that is going to be here long term, that it's more of a blip. W mm -hmm. Would you say that that's a, an accurate characterization? I think at first uh, that it was just um, you know, a part of the, the entire uh, outlook on demand. They really, did, they really discounted the retail investor. But we see the reports coming from the Silver Institute last year, a major portion, a major piece of the pie actually went to retail investors. So yes, the mom and the pop are waking up and they're looking at the value of silver, comparing it to all of the other bubbles out there, all of the other extremes out there. Silver is a safe play, gold is a safe play, and no one wants to roll the dice with their wealth at this moment in time. 
you know who else doesn't want to roll the dice with their wealth is Ooh. the Hungarian Central Bank. Yes, I read uh, that. I don't know if you Very saw exciting. that article, but um, they, they've increased their gold reserves by 3,000% mm -hmm. over the last three years, uh, something we can dig into in the next segment. You know, there's a lot to talk about in the, with regard to this investment demand. You've got the reasons for investment demand. I think I'd like to discuss that in terms of, you know, you've got right now, just to set this out for the next segment, you've got this... Um, society right now where everything feels fake and and you get desensitized to how much money is being created and it's very easy to just say you know what well, maybe I'll just believe the narrative and let's go along with that and things are let's pretend things are good that they're gonna reopen the economy and all this stimulus and and uh, everything that's gonna be happening uh, infrastructure all of that but this is this is all a good thing and raising taxes is a good thing and the stock market should only really go up from here everything should be uh, coming up daisies from from here on out or green shoots I guess and um, you know what what does that mean for silver going forward? So let's discuss that in the next segment, the number one eight seven seven eight silver the website, guildhallwealth.com. If you'd like to get some physical silver in your portfolio, it's easy. Just give it, call the number, go to the website. You can also go to guildhallpreciousmetals.com or consider putting physical, allocated, segregated product in your registered account, your RSP, your TFSA, your Lira, your LIF, your RIF. Even your RESP, I think that's something that that uh, not enough people are using. Putting, getting some physical gold for your kids. Again, the number one eight seven seven eight silver. The website guildhallwealth.com. This is the Real Money Show, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Real Money Show. The number one eight seven seven eight silver, and the website guildhallwealth.com. Remember, next week you want to tune in because we've got from the Trends Journal. Gerald Salente on the show. He's always exciting to have around. And lately, Jerry, he's been he's been on a roll on a on, on YouTube. He's yeah. been uh, having some some crazy rants, which we always expect. Yeah, but they always make sense. Always has, yes. Yeah, I love the Trends Journal. So definitely, definitely tune in for that. We'll also be posting that onto YouTube. So we've talked about some availability. We've talked about the fact that now that. There's, they're closing down one of the most major sectors, um, you know, resources for metals, which is Mexico. They've shut down their mining, which is obviously going to have an effect again on the supplies, which we saw even last year where, you know, the refining capacity got shut down. You've got the logistics issues shutting down, you know, the cost to get things around is expensive. So, you know, it is, is again, I'm going to kind of ask this again, is this kind of a blip? Could this just be a blip that, you know, okay, the Wall Street bets people, they they thought they could silver squeeze the, the market. It didn't exactly work. They're sitting on this this silver now. They're wondering what's going on with silver. I think it's, I, I dare say, I, I, I think we're, we're watching the correction. You know, silver mm -hmm. moved up from 18 to 31. It's It's been bouncing around the mid-20s ever since, you know, 24 to 27, bouncing back and forth. Um, it certainly feels like it's on the launch pad, like it's the calm before the storm. Yep. yep. But uh, was it all a blip? Is 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 that it? it the, you know, eventually the capacity will come back. There'll be plenty of mar plenty of product around. No one will have an interest in metals because hey, we can get so much returns in other things like stocks and and cryptos. No, uh, I mean we could just clearly see with the stock market, it's it's. It remains disconnected from national economies. Look at the debt, the runaway debts, and many investors, as I mentioned, are nervous and are looking uh, f for precious metals, are looking for safety uh, in the event of a market meltdown. And what's interesting, uh, is some analysis from Gold Silver, they released a chart during the week that looked at gold and silver during stock market crashes, and, and it proved that during these, you know, going back to the 70s, Gold and silver performed during these times. Gold much more than silver. Obviously, silver has some industrial attributes to it, but you 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 definitely see that silver does perform better than the stock market during these times. And what I found very key that had to do with supply is that during these market sell-offs, there was huge. It was actually it was very difficult to acquire physical precious metals during this time. Why are we not seeing metals of readily available during these times? Are investors already preparing for a market sell-off? You know, a blip, 
I, I highly doubt. I think this is a trend, and I think we'll have Gerald Salente comment on this particular trend to see if this is just, um, you know, some emotions because of, um, uh, of, of Wall Street bets, but I doubt it. I think smart investors, investors, smart money are looking to physical precious metals like the Hungarian Central Bank. Too bad the Canadian Central Bank can't do the same. So Canadians have to do it uh, for ourselves. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Hungarian Central Bank here for a moment. You know, in 2018, I'm reading from the article here, uh, the Monetary Council of Hungarian Central Bank said it was buying large quantities of physical gold since, here's the quote, gold is still considered to be one of the world's safest assets whose characteristics can be attributed to gold's unique properties, such as finite supply of physical gold and lack of credit and counterparty risk given to gold is not a claim against a specific partner or country. Gold remains one of the safest instruments in the world and even under normal market conditions, providing stability and confidence building function. I love that, uh, that idea of the confidence building function. I think, you know, what you were talking about earlier, Jerry, this idea that there's just market distortions. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you trust what the stock market's going up? Is that a reflection of the true economy? The mom and pop stores have been completely decimated. You see people are, are clearly losing their jobs. You hear about it. You know it's happening, but, you know, you can still walk into major box stores. So that's okay. They're surviving, and they're the ones with the stocks on the stock market. So there's sure. a distortion. Then, then you've got this idea of all the money printing, and on, on the one hand, you go, Hooray, money printing, free money. Let's get it. You know, mm -hmm. what, what, you know, let that, let that roll. Let it, uh, increase the economy. And, uh, you know, you've infrastructure spending. Woohoo. Let's build bridges. But I mean, have you looked what's in that thing? The more and more information that comes out mm -hmm. about what is implied in that, that are completely not infrastructure related. <laughs> um, you just wonder where all these payouts are going from and all of this money just gets printed for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. which I think is another distortion in and of itself. So I wonder if, if people just sense in a way, the way they intuitively know that gold is the barometer of the, financial system, if they just kind of see through that and they say, wait a minute, you're printing money, you're raising taxes, I can't open my business, how is this supposed to be um, a positive influence here, you know, uh, even with Janet Yellen trying to, I mean, uh, Nomi Prince wrote a whole book about central right. bank collusion. Uh, she was a central banker, head of the Fed, and now she's talking about getting collusion mm -hmm. to raise the raise the tax rate, corporate tax rate, so that no one can move anywhere. Because what happens is you raise the tax rate somewhere, and you know inevitably, smart business. Business mm -hmm. people say, well, this is stupid. I'm moving my business. Right. You can tax the little guy. Don't tax us. We're, we're creating the business. We're creating right. employment. We're creating, uh, we're building the economy. So they move somewhere else. Well, they're trying to cage that off. Right. They're trying to put the fence on, on the sheep. And, and, uh, I just, I, I don't see how that's productive for the economy. Absolutely not. I mean, this is, this is actually going to be in detrimental to this economy, the American economy, the global economy. Uh, this, this type of uh, taxation is going to be implemented around the world. Um, ultimately leads to, I mean, call it imprisonment. Um, we are, you know, in a, a time and era where the information is there, the data is there. We, we can look into the infrastructure deal in the U.S., what's inside of it. The information is there, and Canadians and Americans are reading this, and they're waking up to the fact that, hey, I need to start taking control of these areas of my life. I want to prepare uh, for the worst case scenario, and gold is one of those. Um, you know, going back to the the reasons why I liked the the Hungarians' reason, the Hungarian central bank's reasons uh, for increased confidence. It, it boosts confidence, especially in these dark times. Uh, why? You know, they know the studies, like the Ibbotson Associates. Uh, they they broke it down. They looked at the sharp ratios, Sortino ratios, and, and they concluded that, that without precious metals in your portfolio, in your possession, you're, you're, just, you're just not diversified. Why? Because there is no counterparty risk with gold. There is sufficient liquidity for large investors, and it's not dependent on management 
for performance. So you're not relying on the accounting department to do their job or you know, the board to, to do their job or the CEO to stay on board with the company. Right. It doesn't rely on these things. It's totally disconnected. Um, and we need a little bit of disconnection from the madness that, that's happening in the world today. And, you know, similar to the Hungarian Central Bank, we brought up last week, uh, I brought up the fact that the Russian uh, wealth fund was mandated by the Russian government to get some gold for the pensions, to back up the pensions with some gold. Folks, we are at a point where without gold in your portfolio, um, you will be open to these tailwind risks. And, um, you know, our, our job here at Guildhall is just to bring light and shed light on some of these articles, some of these news reports and what the big money is doing and why they're doing it and why you should be doing it as well. And they've experienced it before, right? They, you know, in, in Hungary, yeah. they know what inflation looks like. They've, they've gone through hyperinflation in the past. And in those situations, um, you know, you, you know that having a physical asset is where the wealth preservation lies. I like this idea as, as well as the confidence build, building function, um, the stability of what gold brings, because in a world of fiat currencies where, where value is completely relative, right? What's the value of the US dollar? Well, it's, it's trading this against a basket of other fiat currencies. What's the, what's the value of the Canadian dollar? Well, it's trading its value against the, the US dollar, and it's just relative to each other, but there's actually no tether to tell you what the, the value of it is. One of the reasons actually, I think we did a show several weeks back about buying a house with silver. And one of the reasons I think that was um, so successful, why people really were engaged with that particular topic is this idea of people understand housing mm -hmm. and they understand the value of it, you know, because it's such a big investment, right? right? Um, you know, you have to sign all these things, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it, it, you can, you get a sense of the value of the metal in relationship to another asset. Right. Um, whereas with fiat currencies, there is no relationship there. It's just relative to each other. So having gold as that tether or silver as that tether gives you a sense of stability. And of course, gold is the stabilizer. You can see that as gold has not just gone up. Its price hasn't gone up. It's the other currencies have mm -hmm. gone down. Gold is real money. It's just held its value. Speaking of that, uh, you brought in a great article, which, which Paul actually gave, uh, brought to our attention. But uh, just talks about the rising prices, about inflation and such. Can you can you share a little bit of with that? Yeah, it was an article uh, written by Peter Janelli. He's an independent an analyst at uh, FX Street. So part of our job here is to view, uh, you know, keep an eye on the currencies, um, and we use some analysis. In this case, it's from the FX Street, and he does a great job in breaking down for the readers uh, the the the. Um, the effect of inflation and the effect of money printing and the loss of purchasing power due to fiat currencies just you know having runaway printing presses and ever since 1933 uh, this erosion 1933 this erosion had, had started to occur and we fast forward today if you had a you know $20 bill you buried that $20 bill back then uh, fast forward to today you could probably buy a couple burgers some fries and maybe uh, get some change back Let's dig more into yeah. this article in the next segment. The number one eight seven seven eight silver. The website guildhallwealth.com. We're going to talk about uh, how what what the numbers actually look like in the real world in terms of inflation. What things used to cost, what they cost now, what the price of gold used to be, what the price of gold is now, and just to exactly show you the the way s gold and silver have hedged inflation and how they've been so integral to wealth preservation not just over the last decade not just over the last two decades but over the over the last many many decades i mean going back uh, almost 90 years in this case we're talking about physical assets and ways to protect your wealth now this is versus making money Mm -hmm. Jerry, I think a lot of people right now are very much focused on short-term investing, short-term money making. There's a lot of things that are blowing up and, and there's definitely great opportunities out there, but that's not exactly what we're discussing today. No, we were, we're definitely discussing a strategy of uh, wealth and capital preservation and preserving what we have and ensuring that we get a return of our money versus the return on our money. 
So we brought uh, Paul brought an amazing article from FX Street. I'm just going to share the first couple paragraphs sure. from the article. I think he does a great job in 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 giving us a picture of the the stealth inflation, the stealth loss of purchasing power, and what that looks like. So he goes back in 1933 when an ounce of gold was trading around twenty dollars per ounce. The median income for the average American household was about fifteen hundred per year. Wow. So as you can well imagine, twenty dollars back then could go a very long way. You can essentially go to the mo go to the most expensive store in Beverly Hills and buy the most expensive suit for twenty bucks. And upon discovering this careless spending, your family and friends would think you were insane to have spent twenty dollars on a single suit. Now imagine you had to twenty dollar bills, two twenty dollar bills in nineteen thirty three, and you put one of them under your mattress and then the other one uh, to buy an ounce of gold. Fast forward today, eighty eight years later. $20 under your mattress can buy you a couple burgers, some fries, and if you're lucky, you get some change back. Yeah, or as I like to say, it's a, it's a latte and a magazine. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. However, the ounce of gold you had purchased, if you sold it at today's spot price of $17.30, it'll enable you to go back to that same store in Beverly Hills and buy that same suit. Okay. And uh, the, that, so That's the good old, you can always buy a suit with an ounce of gold. I mean, you're not buying a Tom Ford suit. Yeah. I think that that's that just shows you gold still undervalued because mm -hmm. we're not we're not up to five thousand dollars an ounce yet, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll get there. And this article talk it gives us a good chart and a good view, um, which summarizes the headline of the article: How much less will your money buy in goods and services in the next ten years? So what they have done, they have um, given us a a chart uh, and a look at some prices for some goods from 2008 to today. Okay, let's just set that up for a minute because sure. anyone who's been to the grocery store lately already has seen that that increase. Um, I've even been to stores uh, recently and I know it's probably because restaurants are closed and things like that, but you know, grocery stores where thing, the, you know, the, the shelves are wiped out. You know, like the regular produce, it's tough to get in some cases. But then what you can get, um, on, you know, on, on a regular basis, prices are definitely higher. You, you, you don't need to be an economist when you're checking out and you're pu pulling out your credit card and you say, whoa, <laughs> okay, uh, this, is, this is like going out for a really expensive meal, mm -hmm. right? For, for two and nice bottle of wine and, uh, you know, pay the server, pay the tip. And you're just like, I, I just got like two bags of groceries. Exactly. You're going to pay more, obviously. And you can say it's a little bit of an increase in quality of goods, quality of the wine, quality of, you know, the electronics that we're buying. But we're not going to triple in, in value or the price should not be tripling in a matter of uh, 13 years. Okay. So let's look at 2008 so till... Today? To today. Okay. So from 2008, I highlighted a few. So coffee. Everyone drinks coffee. Love well, coffee. I, yeah, I love it. Back in 2008, a two-pound can of coffee was $5.49. Fast forward to today, $9, $10. So it's up 81%. Um, tomatoes, a one-pound bag, $0.68 cents per pound. Today, $2.49, up 266%. Potatoes, one pound 32 cents back then, dollar 50 today up 365%. The US debt back then it was 10 trillion, today 28 trillion up 180%. But that doesn't matter Jerry because as long as interest rates are low, you can just keep servicing the debt. I'll tell you what matters here. 2008 the average median income 56,000. Today 61,000, up just 10%. Yeah, we're behind. Yeah. That, that's really the key right there is when you just compare how much everything has increased versus your own income increasing. And you know what they didn't include here as well is housing. And housing, yeah, that's right. right. How much housing has, has gone up. It's not just the cost to buy a house, but how much rent has increased mm -hmm. over, over the last, you know, like I, I, I can remember when I was renting a place, mind you, I didn't have to rent a, a, a crazy nice condo or anything. I wasn't doing that. But I was paying well under a thousand. Now I don't think you can get anything unless you're paying like two thousand. That's right. So you know, and that's literally within a decade, probably maybe just over a decade. You're took. You're looking at a hundred percent increase in rents. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Federal Reserve does a great job of saying that there is no inflation. We're under two percent. We need to get higher inflation. We need 
hyperinflation, Jeremy? Are we yeah. where are we going to be going? Well, where are these prices going? Well, this is the whole thing about in, inflation and why it, why it consistently comes up as one of the major factors for precious metals. Right. It's why we drive it every week, talking a little bit about it every week. Is that ultimately it is the it is destroying the purchasing power. It is the confiscation of your wealth, and it's one thing to be aware of it. It's also another thing to be aware of being misguided about it, right? When you listen to central bankers saying, oh, there's no inflation, we're trying to get to 2% inflation. And this whole, this disconnect between the statistics they're using and the numbers they're using and the real world that we're living in where you have to send kids to daycare or, you know, the the cost of your health club went up or your insurance just went up or you looked at your energy bill and said, oh, that's wait a second, I, did I use that much yet? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. what? That's what I said you know, last week. Turn off the computer. You know? yeah. <laughs> turn off the computer. Go to school. <laughs> we need. Like, um, same thing with electric cars, right? It's like people are not going to realize, oh, okay, you're not paying it at the pumps. You're just, your, your hydro bill is going to go through the roof. You're not, <laughs> and where did that come from? All of those things. So, you know, you, you know that you're falling behind. You know that you're kind of trying to run up a, a sand hill. Mm -hmm. And the stability of gold and silver over the years, the amount that it's increased, has done more to protect wealth than, than trying to figure out what's the best investment. This is so simple, right? It's mm -hmm. like, keep it simple, stupid. That's right. And that's what gold and silver does. Does this article talk about how gold has performed? Yeah, actually, it, he does go towards gold because it, it's a, actually an article really supporting the ownership of gold. He goes, here's an interesting fact. If you look at the table below, the average medium income in the U.S. Uh, in, is, uh, is currently at about 62000 a year. In 2008, uh, so 62000 today uh, can buy roughly 35 ounces of gold if you put your, your income towards gold. Back in 2008, the average person was making 56000 They could have bought at 64 ounces of gold. And in year 2000, we could have bought with our income of 42,000, 151 ounces of gold. How much? 151 ounces that of gold. That was back in 2000? Yeah. It's okay. I think that is saying just how undervalued gold was at the time. While you were saying that, I just did a quick calculation. Back in 1933, if you making $1,500 a year, you could have bought 75 ounces of gold. So somewhere between 35, I mean, 35 is way too low. Mm -hmm. um it I, I mean that's ridiculous that you could you know what's 35 ounces of gold at the end of the day that's right it's like a kilo bar that's about it it's interesting he writes because in the past 20 years the annual income has gone up by just 47 percent while the price of gold has moved up over 520 percent so back then your money could have purchased nearly 450 percent more gold than it does today that's how much money your money how much your money has lost in value wow so have something in gold to protect against that because this is the trend. This is the trend that they're keeping us on and it's only getting exacerbated at this point because, inf because of all the money printing and the inflation that's going on. So you need to really have some physical gold now. You need to look at this trend. We're going to put it on our, our Twitter. We'll put, it, we'll put a link to it in the YouTube. We'll put it out in the newsletter. You need to see this chart to understand what this trend is and so that you can clearly understand what it takes to just say, okay, that's it. I'm going to commit to buying and acquiring some physical gold at this point. Even if it's just a few ounces a year, I will build up to my 50 ounces down yeah. the road. Welcome back to The Real Money Show, the number one eight seven seven eight silver the website guildhallwealth.com. If you're just joining us, we were talking in the previous segment about what your annual salary could buy you in terms of ounces of gold. We looked back at 1933, and it was somewhere in the 75-ounce range. Um, in, what was it, in 2000, you could buy 151 ounces, which I think was just a demonstration of just how cheap gold was, but maybe also how how much people were making back in the 90s potentially um but what what do you think jerry is probably more of a realistic how much how much gold should you earn a year well my my salary today jeremy should purchase in my opinion about 70 to 85 ounces of gold today just going back to the scenario the ratios of 1933 and just the key takeaway from this article would definitely be understanding the inverse relationship be between gold and the U.S. 
you know, the U.S. Federal Reserve note dollars. Uh, this is what's determining the purchasing power. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the U.S. has gone full fiat and we have gone full fiat around the world. And, and money printing is just that stealth inflation. You, you are destroying our purchasing power. So this is the way I see it. I don't know about yourself. Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it becomes another good, um, you know, something to look at to give you a sense of value right so you can just kind of say well how many ounces of gold to buy a house how many ounces of gold versus the dow what's the gold silver ratio um just looking at those things so just a sense of understanding value over time i think it would be uh something good to to check out here and there you know what's interesting jerry you were talking about sort of the or you were kind of discussing the monetary experiment of fiat currencies mm -hmm. and it's almost like i feel like we're in the second wave now of it um, maybe the third wave, right? But I'm thinking about 2008 and the invention of quantitative easing and suppressing interest rates forever. The idea that, well, now now we're into money monetary theory mm -hmm. or MMT, um, and the idea that it the debts no longer matter, but of course they do matter because if the interest rates go up, you're you're imploding. But I feel like maybe we're in this third wave of the monetary experiment. And people are really seeing it. They're saying, oh my gosh, this is a lot of money that's being created here. How can this possibly not have any consequences? But surprisingly, in some ways, I, I do think there has been consequences. If you're looking properly, right. you see the consequences. You, you see the distortions. You see the breakdown in values. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere you just yeah. see this complete distortion everywhere and how it, it it started to eat away at the fabric of society in many ways mm -hmm. you, you can see that yeah but on the other hand if you just you know close your eyes to that and you just go well the world keeps ticking the world keeps spinning around so maybe it doesn't matter at the end of the day but history says it does right history says down the road this is not going to be good because there's never been a fiat currency that lasted. So you could say, no, it's different this time. Yeah, what's right. different about it this time is now this is the tsunami right. part of the wave. Yeah, the pile of debt. And historically, there's always been three ways to deal with the mountains of debt. And we have to think about the mountains of debt today. You can either pay it off with increased economic growth and taxes which which you're not going to get because we're past debt to gdp correct so you can't grow out of it once gd uh gdp debt to gdp goes past 100 so it's impossible yeah. number two inflated away with increased inflation or R which which they are kind of doing if you, if you say that that the inflation rates that the central banks are saying is not accurate and they're doing that on purpose. So they're saying, oh, we're trying to get to two, but it's actually more like five or six. Right. And therefore, they are secretly doing yeah, that? secretly doing it. Okay. Or number three, you just default. Oh, that's the easiest one. And then historically, back in 1971, it was the U.S. Treasury Secretary John Connolly to the G10 summit in Rome. And the G10, the G20 just passed this week, actually. But then the Treasury Secretary back then, John Connolly, said, the dollar is our currency, but it's your problem. And oh, that's exactly okay. what these central bankers are saying to us. It's your problem. Yeah. It's not ours. I always thought that was Nixon that said it. John but it Connolly. Was John Connolly. Interesting. The number one eight seven seven eight silver and the website guildhallwealth.com. I just want to uh, take a quick turn before we wrap up the show today. I want to talk about the Green New Deal. Um, some people are saying that's probably the great reset, actually, the Green New Deal. Um, but right now... Physical silver has a deficit of 200 million ounces, give or take. And with the Green Deal, you're going to be looking at solar, wind, uh, electric cars. The demand on silver is probably going to increase, some are saying, by at least another 200 million ounces. That's not including investment demand for people who are looking at the markets and saying, don't like these distortions. Mm -hmm. Silver's cheap. Let's, let's get involved. Let's get involved. Um, but this would be huge. That would mean that there would be almost a 400 million ounce deficit. And especially right now, at the same time, you know, mines like in, in Mexico are shutting down. Mm -hmm. how, how in the world could that not put silver on the launch pad as we speak? At it the is, end of a correction that we've been experiencing probably for about the eight months. Well, s silver is on the launch pad. It's, it's coiled because of these 
these pressures, these extreme pressures in disappearing silver. Elon knows it. Elon Musk knows it. He, he needs silver for his Teslas. He will need silver for uh, the the solar fields, the sol sil solar cities that he owns, and which is part of the reason why I think he's redirected people's attention. This is my thinking, and this is the way I think. He's telling investors, buy the ETF, buy the silver ETF, don't buy the physical silver. Right, right. the silver ETF being that they changed their prospectus to say that just paper. even if the price rises, we're not going to necessarily be able to buy the physical product. So it's going to just be there in the form of, ca like the silver in the account will just be in the form of cash, it's not representing silver. silver. So mm -hmm. it becomes a derivative product, essentially. Right, buy the derivative. People don't want the derivatives. No. So people want the real thing. That's why at Guildhall, we offer allocated and segregated accounts where clients can own their physical product directly. It means the day you decide, no, you know what? I want to take delivery of it. Great. There's no conversion pricing here because you already own the product. So, you know, let's put this, wrap this all together. We've got Central Bank of Hungary. They've, uh, they've increased their supply. You've got, uh, Mexico shutting, shutting its mine supply down. You've got stimulus out the wazoo. You've got inflation most likely there, the real, real world level at least. Consider moving a lira into um, our accounts where you can acquire physical precious metals. And by the way, I didn't also mention very quickly this week that BMO, Bank of Montreal, they had someone at Bank of Montreal call out the Bank of Canada for creating the real estate bubble. That's a, a, a nice little nugget right there at the end. Um, next week on the show, we've got Gerald Salente. So so uh, definitely join us next week on The Real Money Show. The number one eight seven seven eight silver the website guildhallwealth.com. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to having you join us next week on The Real Money Show on Global News Radio 640 Toronto.